The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled A New Wave of Progress in Glioblastoma, Expert Guidance on Delivering Modern Personalized Care with Tumor-Treating Fields and Novel Systemic Approaches, featuring Drs. Stephen Brem, Manmeet Aluwalia, and Nicholas Blondin. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash EWB 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we're going to have uh, two great speakers who are experts in glioblastoma, the, um, and uh, we'll introduce them shortly. Our panelists, Mami Awalia and Nicholas Blondin. Before then, I just want to give a couple of slides on the overview of uh, the, to frame the problem. So I think we all familiar with glioblastoma but these are some of the um, challenges that we have and some of the unanswered questions. Number one, uh, the age relate, you know, so if uh, uh, there's something um, about, if you're gonna have a glioblastoma, the survival rates are much better. If you're in the first bracket, uh, young adult, up to 20, up to from 20 to 44, if you're in, these, the uh, five-year relative survival rate drops from 22 to 9% if you're in the age bracket of 45 to 54. And then if you're um, 55 and above to 64, the five-year survival rate drops uh, to 6%. So something about uh, immunosenescence or senescence. Glioblastomas present unique treatment challenges due to the following. As you know, the uh, localization of the tumor within the brain and nervous system and the sensitivity there, the inherent resistance to conventional therapy, limited capacity of the brain to repair itself, the dispersion and invasion of the infiltrative cells throughout the brain, uh, the blood supply which is disrupted and ineffective drug therapy delivery due to imperfect uh, angiogenesis and also by the same token tumor capillary leakage. And so we look at this uh, in terms of treatment goals as uh, gaining uh, local control and also the systemic uh, treatments. So um, as a surgeon, uh, we're focused on local control. Also radiation will be conformal Stereotactic radio surgery has uh, a role, and tumor treating fields. I view this as both uh, locally and as throughout the brain. Uh, but um, then we go to systemic th chemotherapy, the biological agents, immunotherapy, and targeted therapy. So our, our uh, distinguished speakers will be addressing those newer modalities. Today's goal uh, is to look at some of these uh, barriers. And uh, for example, tumor treating field therapy was approved by FDA uh, 10 years ago. It's considered standard of care, yet implementation is very poor in the uh, relatively uh, low in the clinic. Only three to 12% of those with newly diagnosed glioblastoma uh, receive the electrical field therapy. And for a current disease, it's um, between zero and 16%, so quite uh, poor. So we'll hear from Dr. Nicholas Blondin on integrating modern modalities in the management of uh, GBM and how can we best apply the latest science. Yeah. And then we're also going to be looking at Dr. Um, Manmi Walia will be looking at practice guidelines um, and surveying the horizon, looking at the other innovative therapies that are coming along and with a focus on clinical trials. And um, unlike the pediatric population where most children are in clinical trials, for adults, only uh, around 10%, fewer than 11% are actually enrolled in clinical trials. So uh, that's certainly an uh, opportunity for improvement there. Uh, Dr. Blondin uh, will be uh, talking about integrating modern modalities and systemic therapies in the management of glioblastoma and how we can apply the latest science today. Um, he is on the faculty at Yale and uh, very active in the Smilo Cancer Center at, at New Haven and Yale. 
So turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. I'll be speaking on tumor treating fields or TT fields, a relatively new cancer uh, modality, uh, although as Dr. Brem mentioned, it's been approved for uh, treatment of glioblastoma for over 10 years. And I'll be reviewing some of the data supporting the use of TT fields. And we also have uh, some video clips on a patient journey uh, with a patient utilizing TT fields, which was done in collaboration with the American Brain Tumor Association. So tumor treating fields or TT fields were first introduced into the clinic in 2004. A pilot study was done demonstrating feasibility of treatment. And following that, a study was done in recurrent glioblastoma patients, the EF4, uh, EF11 study, demonstrating equivalent survival uh, times for patients treated with TT fields as a monotherapy versus a physician's best choice chemotherapy. That led to the FDA approval uh, in recurrent GBAM in 2011. Subsequently, a large study was done in um, newly diagnosed patients utilizing TT fields along with TMZ in the maintenance phase of treatment after radiation. And this led to the FDA approval for newly diagnosed patients in 2015. More recently, TT fields are being investigated for other, um, other tumor types. And there is an approval in 2019 for uh, unresectable um, mesothelioma and many other uh, trials are ongoing in solid tumors such as lung, uh, pancreatic, and ovarian cancer. TT fields have um, been adopted as an NCCN category one recommendation for treatment for patients with glioblastoma. This is uh, the NCCN uh, slide for patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma age under age 70 and uh, good performance status. TT fields are a category one recommendation for both methylated and unmethylated patients. And also for patients uh, over age 70 with good performance status, TT fields are category one for methylated and unmethylated patients. So despite this, the use of TT fields um, in GBM patients generally still um, appears to be low. And so we'll be addressing some best practices for overcoming some challenges and barriers to prescribing TT fields for patients with GBM. TT fields are, uh, I like to think of as kind of like a fourth pillar of tumor treatment. You have surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and now electrical field therapy with TT fields. And these function as an anti-mitotic therapy working during the mitosis or M phase of cell division with TT fields disrupting the physical process of tumor cell division, whereas radiation and chemotherapy damage DNA and affect uh, cell division at a different phase. So TT fields can be used synergistically with chemotherapy and possibly radiation therapy as some trials are investigating, uh, which I'll allude to later in the talk. And TT fields uh, has a few different mechanisms of action in cells to disrupt cell division. One of those being inhibition of tubulin polymerization into microtubules by affecting a process called dipole alignment in ch of charged molecules. And a second um, electrical property known as dielectrophoresis prevents large charged macromolecules from segregating normally from one cell into the two daughter cells. At this point, we'll show a brief video um, further describing the mechanism of action of TT fields. In metaphase of cell division, cells are a rounded shape as the mitotic spindle forms. Intracellular components such as macromolecules and organelles are naturally charged. Tumor-treating fields, or TT fields, disrupt cancer cell division by physically interacting with molecules required for mitosis. When alternating electric fields are applied to cancer cells, they disrupt microtubule polymerization. Tubulin dimers align with the electric field and are not able to form microtubules. This prevents the organized assembly of the mitotic spindle required for normal cell division. The inhibition of microtubule formation leads to metaphase arrest and cancer cell death. In addition, these deformed microtubules can lead to abnormal DNA segregation between daughter cells, which also results in cancer cell death. TT fields can also affect cells after metaphase. If a cancer cell has passed metaphase and enters the cytokinesis phase, the cell takes on an hourglass shape. This state under TT fields creates a non-uniform electric field inside the cell, creating dielectrophoresis. Net forces push the macromolecules and organelles toward the mitotic furrow, and this disruption leads to structural disorganization and cancer cell death. 
TT fields have been found to be um, biologically effective in disrupting cell division of numerous uh, different cancer types. And there is an optimal frequency of the electrical fields to achieve tumor cell kill. In GBM, this is 200 kilohertz. TT fields are delivered via a uh, medical device consisting of four uh, rays that are placed on the patient's scalp, delivering opposing electrical fields uh, between two sets of arrays. And the arrays are uh, connected via an adapter to the device, which is portable, powered by a battery, or uh, plugged into a wall outlet. Treatment can be individualized for a given patient using a mapping um, system, which can provide the optimal array placement on a patient's scalp. And by optimally placing the arrays, you can intensify the electrical field in the region of the brain where the tumor is. And preclinical studies have demonstrated a higher field intensity leads to better cell kill. I'll now review the EF14 study, which was the pivotal trial uh, for treatment of newly diagnosed patients. And in this study, Patients um, with newly diagnosed glioblastoma would complete standard six weeks radiation and temozolomide chemotherapy and then be randomized in a two to one fashion to receive TT fields with temozolomide or TMZ alone as a monotherapy. As you can see, there were 466 patients in the TT fields plus TMZ arm and 229 patients in the TMZ alone arm. The primary endpoint for the study was the time until the first progression and the secondary endpoint was overall uh, survival. Patients in the TT fields arm could utilize TT fields following first progression until the second progression occurred or 24 months. This study demonstrated a significant overall survival improvement in patients and the intent to treat population. So patients uh, randomized to the TT fields plus TMZ arm had an improvement of their median overall survival of 4.9 months, improved from 16 to 20.9 months, when adding the time um, between surgery and their initial radiation and chemotherapy, patients in the TT fields plus TMZ group survived a median of 24.5 months versus 19.8 in the TMZ alone arm. And again, as you can see with the survival curve, the curve separates uh, essentially at, at time point zero and that separation is maintained over, over time. There uh, was a higher rate of five-year survivors in the TT fields group. This improved from 5% to 13% of patients. Subgroup analysis demonstrated that um, all subgroups appeared to benefit from TT fields treatment. In particular, I'll point out that methylated patients had an increase in median survival time of over 10 months, improved from 21.2 to 31.6 months. Also, patients with any extent of surgery uh, benefited from TT fields treatment. Patients in younger or older age group benefited, um, likely leading to the NCCN designation. And I'd also like to comment on the usage of TT fields for recurrent GBM. As I mentioned, this was approved in 2011 from the EF11 study comparing TT fields alone as a monotherapy versus uh, physician's choice chemotherapy. In that study, the results were uh, in the intent to treat population. Subsequently, a modified intent to treat population was examined. In this group, the, the patients that utilized TT fields for at least one cycle of treatment or 28 days were analyzed. Patients utilizing TT fields for less than 28 days were excluded, up approximately 20 patients. And in this modified ITT population, there was a statistically significant improvement in survival. In the EF14 study, in newly diagnosed patients, quality of life measures um, were collected during treatment and the use of TT fields was found to not have any detrimental um, impact on quality of life. In fact, uh, in data showed that patients had a longer time until neurological deterioration and lengthening of quality of life in the TT fields arm, likely as a function of improved progression-free survival. Specific TT fields um, directed quality of life measures are now being looked at. There were two abstracts here at Snow uh, analyzing uh, this as seen in the blue box. TT fields were found to have improved um, overall survival advantage with higher rates of use. As one would expect, TT fields have biological activity when they are being applied to the patient. So the more time that the tumor cells are exposed to TT fields, the better the survival outcome was found to be for patients. In the EF14 study, a majority of patients utilized TT fields from 70 to 90% of the time. A smaller um, percentage of patients were able to utilize more than 90% of the time. 
but it was found that a survival advantage occurred starting at 50% uh, of the time at, at least. Uh, as per the labeling, TT fields are indicated for use at least 75% of the time. Now let's just comment on a patient's journey. As I mentioned, we partnered with ABTA for this presentation. And Mary is our, our patient who has been utilizing TT Fields therapy. She was diagnosed with GBM in September 2018 after experiencing stroke-like symptoms. Following her diagnosis on surgical resection of her methylated IDH wild type tumor, she started TT Fields after uh, completing standard radiation. Now we'll hear from Mary on her experience. I row um, on the Charles River. Oh, wow in like a single or a double rowing shell. So I don't bring the backpack with me in case the boat flips. Um, so some days I just unplug from this thing on my waist. I just unplug these four ports and I wrap this wire around my head and then I put a buff or a scarf to, to hold them in place while I row. And I leave the, the backpack in the locker. And then when I get off the water, I just replug in and I, I turn everything back on and I don't lose any time of treatment. Very little time. If I'm only on the water, 45 minutes or an hour, I've only lost 45 minutes which is not too bad. And then I've got the drive time of treatment. Um, and then I, then I've been doing pretty well. I've been getting like 80%, 87%, 86% usage every month. Great. Yeah. Really sounds like, you know, there, there are some parts of this therapy that have impacted your day-to-day, -day, but you haven't let it take away the things that you enjoy, like camping and, and rowing. You've just found ways to, to adjust so that you can still get this therapy, but still do the things that mean a lot to you. So your your quality of life is still is still there and you're enjoying what you're doing. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I'd like to touch on some emerging strategies um, to further advance treatment for GBM patients. TT fields are being um, looked at in newly diagnosed patients used in combination with radiation therapy, initiating treatment with TT fields at the time of radiation initiation. Uh, pilot study has been done demonstrating feasibility of this. TT fields are also being investigated for use with immunotherapy, such as pembrolizumab, Dr. Tran um, gave a really interesting abstract um, demonstrating feasibility of treatment of, with pembrolizumab and TT fields. And TT fields may disrupt the cellular membrane or enhance the immuno, immunological effects. In regards to combining TT fields with radiation therapy, TT fields and radiation have complementary and non-overlapping mechanisms of action, affecting tumor cells at different um, points of cell division. With, um, with this, it again is hypothesized that initiating TT fields along with radiation therapy may provide even better outcomes for patients. And this is being investigated in a phase three study um, termed the Trident trial, uh, TT fields plus concomitant radiation followed by TT fields plus TMZ maintenance. In this, patients with newly diagnosed GBM uh, randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to receive TT fields at the start of radiation therapy, followed by continuing TT fields with maintenance TMZ versus the conventional um, way of doing radiation and temozolomide and then initiating TT fields with maintenance temozolomide. The primary endpoint of this study is overall survival and 950 patients are planned to be enrolled. The study is actively enrolling. In regards to adverse events seen with TT fields therapy, the most common adverse event is skin irritation. Uh, this is on the scalp where the arrays are placed. The most common um, irritation, or, or most common diagnosis uh, seen is pruritus or itching. Patients may also experience hyperhidrosis, excessive sweating, or ulcerations and erosions, a more serious skin condition if patients experience more significant skin trauma. 
Propuritis or itching treatment um, can be done with topical steroid uh, treatment and trimming the arrays to decrease the uh, amount of uh, the uh, adhesive contact in the patient's scalp. Moving the arrays with each array change also can decrease um, some skin adverse events as demonstrated in the, the uh, picture on the le left. <laughs> now we'll watch a short video of Mary describing the measures that she takes with array changes. Sounds like you're having to, to make decisions and make plans around the therapy. Yeah, around the shower and then, so they have to come off and then I have to get a shave again every time. And then we put, we try to get all the glue off with witch hazel or alcohol. Alcohol is a little harsh. And then put cortisone cream on so it's not itchy. And then trim the arrays, the, uh, the pads, and then they go on. Uh, some concluding thoughts, um, I kind of like to offer my perspective on treatment of patients with TT fields. A common patient concern can be just experiencing information overload, feeling um, like TT fields seem like a lot to understand, a complex system to use, and I try to help patients understand there's a learning curve associated with the medical device, and it gets easier with time. Um, like most things in life, uh, becomes much easier with practice. And I try to not let patients get feel discouraged um, right at the start of treatment and give them a pep talk to try to utilize uh, devices as much as possible and try to improve month after month from there. Pa some patients may also express reluctance to shave their head, a perfectly valid concern. I empathize with the patient and you can nor normalize this for patients. Most patients do wear some kind of uh, covering over their head where the arrays are, such as a hat or a scarf. Wigs can also uh, be worn, uh, particularly if loosely woven. And then some patients will have a fear of being a burden um, to their caregiver or feeling like the treatment will require a lot of work and they don't wanna make their uh, caregiver responsible for that. But again, I think it's important to empathize with the patient and you can consider a caregiver pool. Maybe um, like a few individuals could be assigned to help with the array changes and by, again, help patients recognize that with appropriate use of TT fields, this can delay progression and maintain quality of life for a longer period of time. And finally, if patients feel overwhelmed about using the device for the prescribed uh, amount of 75% of the time, again, remind patients, practically speaking, the arrays are placed on the scalp, uh, essentially uh, all times except during array changes, and then it really, uh, the treatment is being actively delivered when the device is turned on. So if worn at nighttime, that's already 50% of the time of, of a 24 hour period. And that can kind of help patients understand if they need to take breaks to do activities such as rowing, um, you have time banked up to do that. So now uh, we'll watch a short video of Mary provide some concluding thoughts. And following that, we'll pass to Dr. Aluwalia. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to other patients that might be in your shoes that are exploring treatment options and, and trying to make that decision? Um, I mean, I think I've, I've, I've surpassed the, my projected life expectancy. So that's what you have to weigh is maybe beating that, the odds and having, you know, life, longer life, and continue maybe doing what you love, but do it with modification. Like, you know, I love rowing, but I think I've, I've made it that I'm just as happy doing yoga. All right, so um, it's a great pleasure then, uh, that was so moving uh, to, continue with uh, Dr. Mami Wawalia, who's Chief of Medical Oncology, Chief Scientific Officer, and Deputy Director of the Miami Cancer Institute, and a great um, thought leader and opinion leader in the field, who will give us an overview of uh, the, what's, what's in store for us as clinicians and our patients to improve glioblastoma care and outcomes. Mami? 
Uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone for coming here today. Uh, thank you to Dr. Brem for asking me to talk on uh, glioblastoma and the what's on the horizon. And I uh, would like to congratulate Dr. Blondin on a very eloquent and a comprehensive talk on uh, tumor treating fields. Thank you. So as has been spoken before, glioblastoma, we have limited treatment options. And what they are, as has been outlined by Dr. Blondin, is also on the slide which is when patients get uh, diagnosed, they need to undergo maximal possible safe resection, which is typically followed by radiation with concurrent and adjuvant timozolomide, uh, along with uh, tumor treating fields. And you saw the recommendations based on the NCCN guidelines that Dr. Blanin went over. Uh, unfortunately, despite this, most of our patients actually progress within six to nine months of diagnosis. And there are a number of uh, therapies that have been outlined here, which include bevacizumab, Sometimes our patients can be re-challenged with temozolomide with altering schedules, metronomic dosing, depending on how long are they away from the initial diagnosis. We use other alkylating agents that include lamustine or carmustine. There have been combinations of procarbazine, carmustine, and vincristine that has been used. Uh, regrafenib is often a modality that has been recommended based on a Spanish study that I'll go on. And then we know there are certain uh, tumor types in glioblastoma, they're subtyping of the tumor where they may have a gene fusion. And we know there are two drugs which are being approved on the basis of the pan tumor uh, based on N-track gene fusions, which include larotrectinib and entrectinib. Uh, there is, uh, you know, previous therapies like etoposide or platinum-based therapies, which have been used in our patients who live long and have utilized some of these other modalities. And there is some interesting data coming with uh, BRAF and MEK inhibition in those patients who harbor the BRAF B600 uh, activating uh, mutations. And we do know that the combination of BRAF and MEK inhibition is generally better with BRAF inhibition alone because MEK is the most common pathway of resistance. So you have combinations of debrafenib, trametinib, or vimbrafenib along with cobimitinib. Uh, so this is the study uh, which was led by Wolfgang Wig, was done to the URTC group, and essentially really outlines the couple of treatment options that we have for our patients as standard of care uh, if they progress. And as we discussed, unfortunately, most of our patients uh, progress despite initial treatment. And this was a study which was uh, uh, exploring the benefit of bevacizumab along with lamustine compared to lamustine, which has been pretty much been the de facto standard of care for our patients over several years. This was a two is to one randomization. And as you can see, uh, close to 300 patients were treated with the combination of lomustine and bevacizumab compared to around 150 patients who got uh, lomustine alone. And as you can see, pretty much overlapping curves, the blue curves uh, demonstrating the benefit with lomustine and bevacizumab, and the red curves with lomustine alone, pretty much showing very comparable overall survivals in the ballpark of nine months. So essentially, uh, based on this, a lot of patients have been treated with lomustine again, and lomustine has pretty much become the comparator arm for most of our trials. And as you can see, this was a phase two trial called Regoma, which was done in Europe. And essentially here, rografenib, uh, basically, which is a drug that targets, uh, it's a multi-kinase, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor that targets VEGF, but also targets a number of other uh, things, including PDGF, KIT, uh, was shown to have a better survival compared to lomustine. Uh, and there was some benefit even with progression-free survival. One caveat here to consider is actually that the benefit of overall survival in the in our arm was 7.4 months compared to lomustine, which was 5.6 months, slightly lower than some of the recurrent glioblastoma outcomes that we have seen and as you saw on the previous slide. But nevertheless, an, an, a drug which is, adds to the armamentarium of what we have for our patients, and we are looking at this uh, a drug uh, in a number of uh, trials right now so essentially, uh, as Dr. Brem had outlined, and as we saw uh, in the NCCN guidelines, the number one recommendation for any patient with glioblastoma is consideration of a clinical trial. That we have this dubious distinction of being a very rare tumor type where clinical trial recommendation is above standard of care. If you open the NCCN compendia, most of the times it's standard of care or clinical trial. In our case, it's clinical trial is even higher. It's the preferred option for eligible patients. Despite that, fewer than 11% of our patients in glioblastoma enroll in clinical trials. And there are a number of um, uh, reasons why this is the case, and uh, we need to work together to improve patient access because a lot of patients live far away from uh, centers of excellence, which typically have these trials. And so uh, definitely improving patient access can help us bridge that gap. 
uh, often we have been criticized in recent years for making a criteria too restrictive. Uh, and that limits a lot of patients getting onto the clinical trials. And the other uh, challenge that we have in glioblastoma, and it's a, one of the key takes away, if you uh, will take one away from this talk, is that there is no agent that has ever shown any survival benefit in recurrent glioblastoma till date. And so unfortunately, a lot of times when you look at pharmaceutical de drug development, it typically starts in the recurrent tumor type, and then it moves to upfront, because that's probably the easier space to develop a drug. But hence, in our case, most drugs that have even succeeded in the upfront setting did not show a survival benefit in the recurrent setting. Temozolomide, tumor treating fields, radiation. So a number of agents unfortunately fail in the recurrent setting and hence are abandoned in the upfront setting. So this is an example of uh, one of the efforts that's going on. This is GBM Agile. Uh, there are around 34 centers in the United States uh, which are participating in this trial. And uh, overall, globally, there are over 50 centers now. It's an adapted phase two, three uh, adaptive design. And uh, regrafenib, the study that I went over, the Regoma study, which showed some survival benefit in rectum setting, was actually the first experimental drug which is ongoing right now. And there are two additional agents, uh, Pexilipsim and Val083, which are also being looked at in this trial option. And a number of agents are actually being considered to, bring, to be brought on through this mechanism. Uh, Insight uh, was an effort uh, led by Patrick Wen, uh, Brian Alexander through uh, the Dana-Farber, and there were 10 institutions which were part of this uh, effort. And this was to go after the newly diagnosed unmethylated GBM. As you know, temozolomide confers a very limited benefit in this patient population. Actually, there is a 24-day benefit if you give an uh, unmethylated MGMT patient uh, temozolomide. So hence, there was an effort in, through this group to look at new therapies based on genotyping for biomarker subtyping, looking at the CDK pathway or the EGFR pathway or PI3 kinase pathway. Uh, and essentially, depending on what the genotype of the patient would be, they were assigned to the, uh, the experimental arm. The control group was a standard radiation plus timosolomide followed by six cycles of adjuvant timosolomide. Uh, so abomens cyclic arm was uh, looking at patients who harbor the CDK alterations where patients got radiation, temozolomide followed by adjuvant abomacyclib. Uh, there was actually uh, the presentation uh, which showed that there was a progression-free survival benefit uh, with this drug, but unfortunately there was no OS benefit. Uh, then uh, CC115 is a, a dual mTOR inhibitor, and essentially uh, this was uh, looking at the PI3 kinase pathway, and then neuratinib arm uh, included those patients who harbored the EGFR alterations. And as you know, neuratinib is a drug that's approved for HER2 altered patients with breast cancer. Uh, this uh, trial just was presented in the previous uh, clinical uh, trial session, uh, which just concluded, and essentially there was no benefit with nirapneb uh, in progression-free survival in this arm compared to the control arm. Uh, but one of the things that we have been excited in the last few years, especially has been gene fusions, and as I talked to you about, that there are several tumors that actually harbor uh, gene fusions. And in, um, in glioblastoma, actually, uh, Anterior Overrun uh, actually led this uh, effort when he uh, found out about the FGFR TAC3 gene fusion, which was a science paper in 2012. And what he showed was that FGFR TAC gene fusion is presented around 3 to 4% patients with glioblastoma. And since then, numerous papers have shown that this is the same number for other gliomas too. But there are other gene fusions which include EGFR CEP14. There is definitely the NTRAC gene fusions and the MET gene fusions. And this is uh, basically uh, data about larotrectinib, which is a one of the two drugs that I spoke to you about, which actually have a, a pan tumor or a tumor agnostic approval based on any patients that have an NTRAC gene fusion. And this is the data in primary uh, gliomas. If you look at the larotrectinib data, across all tumors. So the most common NTRAC gene fusions are actually found in salivary gland tumors. And there, most of the other tumors, the response rates with larotrectinib is around the ballpark of 80%. Uh, if you look at CNS metastases, the benefit with larotrectinib is around 50 to 60%. When you actually look at primary uh, CNS tumors, the response rate is 36%. But still, this is much better than the 5% response rate that we are used to seeing with cytotoxic agents like lomustine. So definitely another drug in our armamentarium for this patient. This actually highlights the need for genotyping or molecular profiling in our patients because we are now, uh, when you look at uh, patients who harbor NTRAC gene fusions, it's been described to be 1% for patients with glioblastoma, 
but 8 to 13 percent with patients with pilocytic astrocytoma. So essentially, it can be an option for those patients who have these uh, alterations. And this is the other drug called Entrectinib, uh, which is basically an inhibitor that targets not only the Entrect gene fusion, but also the ROS1 alterations. So this is the data that was presented with CNS metastases. Uh, um, and this was 12 patients who harbored CNS metastases at baseline. And then there was always a, also a group that did not have CNS metastases as baseline. <coughs> Uh, it's really gratifying to see at least that CNS metastases patients are now being included in clinical trials because a decade back, generally these patients were actually excluded from all clinical trials and had to wait for like a drug to get approved before we could give it to our patients. But here you can see the response rates in the ballpark of 60%, very comparable uh, response rates have been seen with ladotrectinib uh, in this patient population as well when we look at CNS metastases. Now going on the med gene fusions, this is found in around two to two and a half percent patients with glioblastomas. Actually, typically tend to occur more in patients with secondary glioblastomas. And this was a study that was published in Cell a few years back and was actually a study done in uh, China where they actually showed that at least in six patients with secondary glioblastoma who were evaluable, two patients achieved a PR two patients had sta uh, stable disease and two patients had progressive disease. On the basis of this, there's an ongoing trial right now called SPARTA, which is looking at this drug APL101, where they are actually looking at outcomes of this agent in patients with lung cancer who have uh, met 14 skipping alterations, but also are looking at pan tumor types in patients who have uh, met gene fusions as well as uh, met um, uh, amplifications. So definitely an option for patients who harbor these alterations. Uh, 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 a slide about the BRAF MEK inhibition in glioblastoma, as I had earlier alluded to, according to the new NCCN guidelines. Now, this is an option for our patients, and this is based on a couple of uh, basket trials looking at Vembrafenib, uh, where the overall response rate was 43%, progression free survival uh, around six months. Uh, and then there was another trial looking at Dibrafenib and Trimetinib, where the overall response rate was 56%. We have seen this to occur even in melanoma patients with brain metastases. If you use a BRAF inhibitor, you have some response rate, but when you use a BRAF and a MEK inhibitor, you actually have a better outcomes. And similarly, has been described with uh, patients who harbor these alterations. So what are the challenges in glioblastoma? So we uh, will focus on a couple of uh, aspects. Obviously, has, this has been theme of uh, presentations in the last uh, few SNO meetings. One is an approach targeting EGFR. The other one is targeting uh, immunotherapy as a whole. And as you know, EGFR is altered in 50% uh, or so patients with glioblastoma and has been a very active uh, area of interest. We also know the uh, V3 variant is an extracellular domain truncation that occurs in around 25 to 30% of patients with glioblastoma and essentially can lead to constitute activation of that pathway leading to cell proliferation and uh, gr uh, growth of the tumor cells. Uh, so this is a, a fairly busy slide, but essentially the take home point here is that uh, all of our efforts looking at uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that have actually been successful in lung cancer and even in lung cancer brain metastases, unfortunately, including gefitinib or lotinib, have all been negative in glioblastoma trials. Same thing was there for cetuximab, which is basically a monoclonal antibody that targets the EGFR pathway, and nematomizumab, which is another monoclonal antibody that targets the EGFR pathway. Uh, there was a lot of hopes for rindopipimid based on some of the early trials that were done through the Duke group, where we had seen very nice uh, overall survival benefit when we looked at historical controls. Unfortunately, when the, uh, the, trial, the phase three trial uh, resulted, there was no benefit of using rindopipimid in patients who harbor uh, EGFR V3 uh, variants, and this trial was unfortunately negative. Uh, then uh, in uh, SNOW 2020, uh, this was one of the plenary presentations by Dr. Uh, Andy Lassman. Uh, this was a study that was run through the RTOG Foundation, uh, the RTOG 3508 trial, which basically looked at uh, this antibody drug conjugate, where you are using essentially the EGFR uh, pathway as a Trojan horse to get into the tumor, and this was combined with a cytotoxic. And essentially, uh, although there was some glimmer of hope, again, looking at this modality in recurrent glioblastoma, there was no uh, benefit in uh, either progression-free survival or overall survival in the, all the tumors when we looked at this. And unfortunately, the trial failed to meet its primary endpoint. Uh, there was one takeaway that there was some progression-free survival benefit in those patients who had EGFR V3 variant. This is hypothesis generating. Uh, there was a p-value of 0.02. But unfortunately, the overall survival, again, in this subgroup, 
post hoc analysis did not show any difference, both the groups living around 18 to 20 months. So there are still a number of trials which are looking at still EGFR, it's still a pathway. Uh, there are uh, some small ma molecule inhibitors which are being developed, which may be more selective to the alterations as they occur in glioblastoma compared to lung cancer. There are um, uh, these uh, antibody fragment immunotoxin, the, CD, the C2, C7, CD uh, study. There is uh, CAR-T efforts which are being developed, uh, work done actually from Dr. Uh, Brems uh, home institution with Carl June's efforts there, who's really done some revolutionary work in CAR-T, at least in the heme malignancies. And the question is, can we translate this into tom solid tumors, which I think is a little bit more difficult uh, tumor type to treat compared to heme malignancies, but definitely a lot of excitement about uh, these CARs being developed for these patients with EGFR V3 variants. Similarly, there are bites, which are bispecific T cell engagers. We've got bats, which are bi-armed activated T cells going after these uh, patients. And then we have uh, newer ADCs from uh, companies like AbbVie looking at uh, EGFR alteration, including the ABV uh, 3 to 1. And then there are other efforts looking at intra-arterial infusion. We tried that with Bevacizumab before, and there are efforts looking at that with Cetuximab, which is a monoclonal antibody against the EGFR. So and then there is obviously an effort looking at uh, checkpoint inhibitors. We know uh, in the rest of the cancer space, a number of tumors have been um, really had had groundbreaking results because of uh, immune checkpoint blockade. And a classic example of that is lung cancer. Uh, almost two decades back, patients with stage four lung cancer had very similar outcomes like glioblastoma in the ballpark of 12 months. And less than 5% of patients with lung cancer stage four were alive at five years that Dr. Brem had shown for glioblastoma. And now more than 20 to 25% patients uh, with stage four lung cancer are alive at five years. So they've had a dramatic change and most of it has been driven by targeted therapies or checkpoint blockade. Unfortunately, in glioblastoma, as you'll see in my following slides, we've not had that kind of success. Although there are a rare subset of patients with glioblastoma where they have this hypermutation or high tumor mutational burden because of germline biallelic mismatch repair deficiency, they can be uh, uh, really a great candidates for immune checkpoint inhibition based on some work coming from Yale group and actually also work coming from the Toronto group with Eric Buffet and colleagues. Uh, so we've had uh, three large phase three trials which looked at uh, this drug called nivolumab, which targets the anti-PD-1 pathway. The first trial was the Checkmate 143, which was an effort in the recurrent glioblastoma space. The second was, was the Checkpoint 498 study, which was an effort looking at the unmethylated MGMT. Here we looked at just radiation plus nivolumab, comparing it to uh, temozolomide and radiation. And the presentation has, we haven't seen it, but there was a press release showing that the study failed to meet its primary endpoint, unfortunately. And Checkmate 548 was presented uh, at this uh, conference. So this is the Checkmate 4, uh, 143 study, looking at nivolumab, comparing it to bevacizumab in patients with recurrent glioblastoma. And here you can see it was one-to-one -to -one randomization, a study of close to 300 patients. And you can see here, again, overlapping curves with blue, with nivolumab, with bevacizumab, which is in the red curves, a hazard ratio of 0 0.04, and no survival benefit with nivolumab and bevacizumab, compared to bevacizumab. And the OS outcomes in both the group was around 10 months. Uh, this was the Checkmate 548. Dr. Michael Weller actually presented the results of a fairly large trial of uh, over 700 patients. And here you can see, again, median progression-free survival of 10.6 months with nivolumab, very comparable to the 10.3 months that we saw with the standard of care arm with radiation and temozolomide. Uh, and similarly, the median overall survival with NEVO radiation and temozolomide was 29 months compared to 32 months with radiation and temozolomide. One thing exciting though to see, at least in this group of patients who are being put on clinical trials because of all the supportive care advancements in surgeries, radiation, and our ability to manage our patients overall in their toxicities, at least the survival curves are moving a little bit to the right. With the caveat that patients, when we look at CA data, do not have these survivals because a number of our patients are not eligible for clinical trials based on progression, uh, sorry, performance status. But at least we're moving the needle jointly. So what are some of the uh, challenges that exist 
with checkpoint inhibition. Uh, Dr. Weller made a point yesterday after his presentation that maybe uh, anti-PD-1 may not be the right target, but there are uh, at least some excitement about the CTLA-4. And we know in, at least in other tumors like melanoma that a combination of CTLA-4 with anti-PD-1 may be a better effort. There's a trial going through the NRG mechanism called the BN-007 trial, which is looking at combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab in patients with unmethylated MGMT glioblast tumor. Uh, this was a study that I was involved with, and I led through uh, in collaboration with my colleague here, David Pierboom, who's in the audience. And here we looked at nivolumab plus bevacizumab because there was work out of Rakesh Chain Slam in Mass General that maybe using low dose bevacizumab may help control the need for steroids, which we have found is a major challenge in our patient population because most of our patients because of mass lesions are on steroids. And we know steroids don't work well in patients who are being put on immune checkpoint blockade because you're trying to boost the immune system with your therapy, and we know that steroids actually lower your immune function. So we looked at this effort comparing nivolumab with bevacizumab in the standard approach and looking at nivolumab with low-dose bevacizumab. And we had a poster presentation last night. Unfortunately, uh, the outcomes in both arms were very comparable and were not very different than what we have seen with Nevo uh, alone or Bev alone. So uh, a valiant effort uh, of a collaboration between Cleveland Clinic and Dana-Farber, uh, not much difference overall. Although what we presented in the poster yesterday that there may be a uh, benefit with the standard dose bevacizumab along with nivolumab in patients who are over 60 years of age. Again, post-doc analysis, so you have to take that with grain of salt. Hypothesis generating at best. Maybe there is some aspect to immune function in elderly that we may be able to target with immune checkpoint blockade. Uh, this was an effort led by Tim Clousey through the IV group, the looking at new adjuvant anti-PD-1 immunotherapy, looking with pembrolizumab, a relatively small randomized trial uh, of uh, you know 16 patients uh, to cohort A and of um, 16 patients to cohort B. One a group got actually new adjuvant uh, pembrolizumab before surgery, and the other group got uh, just uh, adjuvant uh, pembrolizumab. And here you can see very nice separation. Now, this is the basis of an upcoming trial that may explore this effort more going forward. Uh, then uh, Dr. Blondin did a great job talking about uh, the uh, studies. Uh, Dr. David Trans uh, trial looking at tumor-treating fields along with timozolomide and pembrolizumab which was actually presented here, uh, and you can see the abstract. The median follow-up of 15 months with 25 evaluable patients uh, basically showed that progression-free survival was around 11 months compared to seven months in control. Again, hypothesis generating needs to be explored more in a larger trial. One, we're gonna get to four questions, and I'm gonna distribute them uh, equally, two and two. So I'm gonna give the first two because they center on tumor treating fields to Dr. Nicholas Blondin. Mm -hmm. And one question is, um, has two parts. How do tumor treating fields actually affect normal healthy cells? And has it been used in medulloblastoma? If so, uh, how, how does it work in the pediatric uh, medulloblastoma? And how does it affect uh, healthy cells? Yeah, um, well, commenting on the first part of that question, it appears that tumor treating fields do not have any uh, direct significant toxicity to healthy cells. Uh, I believe the device was, or the treatment of TT fields was initially devised for brain cancer treatment because the brain typically does not have dividing cells in adults. But further um, studies, and uh, starting with pilot studies and other tumor types such as lung and pancreas cancer, demonstrated that TT fields appears to be safe uh, in treatment of other regions of the body. Um, so I guess that's, that's how I'll answer part no. number one. So the brain is, a, is an arresting state. It's a quiescent geo organ. So this is a great therapy because it affects Antimitotic normal brain cells are not yeah, mitosis. They the, do a lot of they the do cell a lot of size. Yeah. The cell size does um, have an impact on the efficacy of of, uh, of the treatment. As I mentioned, TT fields applied at 200 kilohertz is most effective to kill GBM cells. For non-small cell lung cancer, it's 150 kilohertz, and then for other tumor types, the cells are different sizes and there's a different optimal frequency. The second uh, question for you. Uh, Nicholas, is why is head shaving so important and what work is being done to eliminate the need for uh, shaving the head? Essentially, head shaving is critical to be able to apply the array directly to the skin. You want uh, to have a patient have direct contact with the transducer array. Um, the fields currently are generated through ceramic disks in the array. Underlying the disk is a hydrogel, um, 
uh, product, and that needs to be applied directly to the skin because if there is some space, for example, if the patient's hair starts growing, stubble develops, and the arrays are pushed off the scalp, that small amount of space, even a millimeter or two uh, with air in it, has high, very high resistance to electrical fields, and we'll, we'll have to make the arrays um, have to essentially like work harder to deliver the uh, electrical fields or heat up. So the device has uh, safety mechanisms to uh, essentially turn off if it's sensing overheating, and overheating uh, alarms could occur if the arrays are not directly applied to the skin. Actually, there's a third question for you, and then we'll go to <laughs> Dr. Murray. Uh, do you know the re mechanism of a resistance acquired to TTF, and uh, what about oxidative stress in glioblastoma, and does that relate to the response to TTF? There's been some interesting work on mechanisms of resistance. There, um, I believe, are some case publications about patients that um, progressed following TT Fields treatment. And uh, in a report I'm aware of, the cells had changed size and had become much larger. And it's hypothesized that at that larger cell size, they were less susceptible to the fields. Another mechanism of escape could be tumor development in other regions of the brain where there's lower electrical field intensity. So as I had me uh, mentioned, the arrays can be optimally placed to deliver the treatment at highest electrical field intensity a certain region. And there are reports of tumors developing um, in other regions of the brain. I saw a poster uh, last night about that. Um, that that's one thing that uh, has been identified. So we're going to uh, transition to Dr. Mami Awalia, and these are um, about other modalities. Um, can you tell us about IDH as a target and uh, what inhibitors are infective? effective for glioblastoma? Yeah, sure. So uh, we did not cover that part because according to the new WHO classification, IDH mutant tumors is actually going to be moved out of glioblastoma and there's going to be a separate classification for these tumors. Uh, and there has been a lot of interest about the IDH and there are a number of uh, modalities which are going about IDH. So Michael Platten uh, has a very interesting vaccine that targets the IDH, which has shown some very interesting results actually. Uh, there are IDH inhibitors, uh, which are uh, targeting IDH1 or 2. We do know IDH inhibitors are approved for other cancers, including leukemia and uh, cholangiocarcinomas. And these trials uh, are, are ongoing looking at these modalities. There are a number of companies which actually have IDH inhibitors. Then there's also a line of thought that, uh, which is being led by Dr. Ranjit Bindra from Yale, that the PARP inhibition actually can use the brackenness that exists in patients who have IDH mutant tumors. And there are a number of trials looking at that with Olapra, uh, either alone or in combination with temozolomide. There was an ABTC study, which was just presented today by Dr. Uh, Schiff, uh, the ABTC1801 uh, study, which look at, looked at another IDH in a bit of it bitter, uh, along with combination with temozolomide. So there is a lot of excitement about these tumors. Uh, the trials are early on, but definitely we know that um, we have to really uh, get to the point that these tumors are truly heterogeneous. And IDH is a definitely a target that we can go after. So uh, stay tuned for more information in the com upcoming meetings of those uh, results. And the final question in the interest of time uh, is, is a pretty broad, open-ended question, but what other modern modalities are being studied in phase one uh, and uh, two, three in trials? I think you covered so many, but are, are there any other um, uh, modalities that you want to discuss? Uh, so one, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we just presented uh, in the previous session, I presented a phase one trial that we did at Cleveland Clinic looking at ruxolitinib which is a jack stat and a bit. Uh, Amy Heimberger and her group has wow. looked at the VP1066, which is another, uh, another drug, which is blood penetrant jack stat and a bit. Uh, and our results were quite uh, you know, impressive, obviously, with the caveat. This was a phase one trial. I'm using that trial because you mentioned the word phase one. Uh, and uh, the survival that we saw in unmethylated MGMT glioblastoma patients was uh, around 18 months. So, which is at least better than what we see with the uh, historical controls of two to 12 to 13 months. But there are a number of other agents which, you know, looking at particular pathways. I think gene fusions is very exciting for me. There are uh, trials which are looking at FGFR gene fusions, which occur in around 3 to 4 percent. I think molecular profiling will be important because now when we start adding these small percentages, we can suddenly, if you say, look at FGFR, which occurs in around 3 to 4 percent, you look at MET gene fusion, which occurs in around 2 to 2.5%, two and, and then you add on n -track gene fusion, which occurs in around 1%. Uh, I think this adds up. So suddenly now we have 6 to 7% of patients with glioblastoma 
who may harbor the gene fusions. And gene fusions are a great target to go after compared to someone who has a mutation or compared to someone who has an amplification. So I think I'm excited about those, uh, those trials. But, uh, you know, again, that is why we do this. We offer the best trials to our patients with the hope. And even as Dr. Brem had outlined, I will say a key takeaway. Our trials may not meet their primary endpoint, but we all have had patients, those few patients, who've done remarkably well for that trial. For that patient and their family, that was a home run. And for me, personally, the whole study is successful because you made a difference in that patient's life. And I'm going to put in a, a plug for a trial that's open uh, now throughout the nation through NRG, a trial I developed with uh, Dr. Steve Bagley who from our place at Penn, who's the national PI on um, targeting IL-6, which is a key cytokine for the um, immunosuppressive environment and which in preclinical data uh, targeting IL-6 has extended survival in animal models. It's also combined with PDL one and uh, with uh, stereotactic uh, surgery. So we hope uh, that uh, yields some interesting uh, information. Um, I think we're coming close to the end of this uh, meeting. And so thank you all for being here today. It was really great. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash EWB 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from NovoCure. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partners, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education, and the American Brain Tumor Association.